welcome to another episode of Auto Mundial, the weekly car news and review show where this week we're taking a look at a pair of convertible supercars from McLaren. And we get blown away by an off-road concept car from Audi, the outlandish iTrail. We also have a fast Mini and the Porsche KM. But first... Euro NCAP crash tests are now set to undergo their biggest changes in a decade in a bid to improve car safety. A complete revamp has arisen because of concerns that today's large SUVs put smaller cars and their passengers at greater risk on the roads, should the unexpected happen. A new state-of-the-art crash dummy called Thor, costing twice the price of a standard dummy at £600,000, closely mimics the behaviour of humans in collisions. A further testing improvement is the updated crash barrier, which is now deformable, moving at 31 miles per hour instead of being static, in order to better reflect real-world collisions between bulky SUVs and smaller hatchbacks. These sophisticated alterations are set to create a new yardstick, encouraging manufacturers of larger vehicles to share some of the burden of an impact, a momentous moment in crash testing expected to save lives. The Volkswagen Group has plenty of fast SUVs on offer. There's the exquisitely appointed 600 brake horsepower Bentley Bentayga, the wild 641 brake horsepower Lamborghini Urus, and now this, the group's most powerful SUV yet, the Porsche Cayenne Turbo SE Hybrid. <laughs> Quite a mouthful, but here are the headline figures. 671 brake horsepower, 3.8 seconds to 62, 183 miles per hour top speed, and enough torque to alter the Earth's orbit. What's more, it has an EV mode capable of carrying you up to 25 miles in silence. I mean, the 4-litre V8 Monster will deliver a WLTP confirmed 52 miles per gallon. On paper, then, this could well be the perfect 4x4. But what's it like to drive? Well, unsurprisingly, it's fast, really fast. The thrust when you pin your foot down soon becomes addictive, even though it is marginally slower to 60 than the lighter Lamborghini Urus. Thanks to all its hybrid gubbins, the e-hybrid is a heavy old thing, tipping the scales at a smidge over two and a half ton. Thankfully though, the Porsche does a good job of disguising its bulk in the corners. Adaptive dampers stiffen the ride, air suspension lowers you closer to the road, and active anti-roll bars do an impressive job of keeping the heavy weight nice and flat, balancing out the understeer. You can even get the tail out if you really push, but most of the time the four-wheel drive system keeps you firmly planted where you want to be. The brakes will start to fade fairly quickly on a spirited drive though, leaving the pedal feeling a bit laggy. But despite its 671 brake horsepower, this isn't the world's most powerful production SUV. No, that accolade falls to this, the monstrous Jeep Trackball. With the same 707 brake horsepower supercharged V8 as the Hellcat, the Jeep does 0-62 in 3.5 seconds and onto a top speed of 180 miles per hour. Climb inside and it all feels pretty normal. You get all the usual grand Cherokee luxuries, nice hi-fi and loads of space. Plant your right foot though and all hell breaks loose. The first thing you notice is the noise. The symphony of the whining supercharger and the roaring V8 is one of the motoring world's greatest soundtracks. And of course, there's no eco-friendly hybrid system in place here. The 6.2-litre V8 provides all the grunt you'd ever need. Putting a Hellcat motor in any car will make it feel instantly special, but the oxymoronic pairing of all that power and slightly overwhelmed chassis means it gets a character all of its own. Don't think that it can't handle itself, though. 
keep it within some reasonable limits and it'll rival most hot hatchbacks. When you really push it though, you realise just how accomplished the rival Porsche's chassis really is. And while the KN lacks the drama and sense of fun you get in the Jeep, it's a far more polished package. Obviously the Porsche is much more expensive, but incomparable fuel economy and congestion charge exemptions will do something to soften the initial blow. The interior is a Liga Park 2, with some gorgeous trim options and unrivalled build quality. Porsche's infotainment is top-notch, while the 911 style dials and steering wheel will make you feel properly special. It's a car that can do everything then. It will silently waft around town, give a KN a bloody nose and even cross a desert thanks to its decent ride height and off-road kit. It's heavy though and expensive and we can't help but feel similar performance could have been achieved without all the extra complexity. It's an extremely capable car though and one that's hard to dislike. When cars get their midlife facelift, they often receive a minimal boost in power to try and convince existing owners to upgrade. Typically, the results are barely noticeable, with styling tweaks grabbing the headlines. This latest Mini Clubman John Cooper works, however, is a little different. While it looks largely the same as the old version, power and torque have been increased by almost a third. While the old car may do with a paltry 228 brake horsepower, this new car gets a whopping 302, making it the most powerful road-going Mini ever made. That big lump of horsepower comes courtesy of its new engine, the turbocharged 2.0-litre from the new BMW M135i. Unsurprisingly, the little all-wheel drive estate is now faster, a lot faster. 0 to 62 has been dropped by 1.4 seconds, meaning the Mini can now do the sprint in just under 5 seconds. That means it finally has the pace to keep up with the hot hatch elite, like the VW Golf R, Audi S3 and even the new Mercedes A35. And so it should, with prices not far off the German competition. The rest of the facelift consists of the typical updates, including new front and rear lights, slightly different bumpers and an updated infotainment system. It's a previous-gen BMW unit tarted up with some mini aesthetics that make it a little tricky to navigate. Like the rest of the cabin though, it looks cool and that's always been a priority for BMW's fun British brand. The rest of the interior is standard mini, meaning it's very nicely trimmed, if a little over the top with its central circular screen housing and plenty of Union Jack styling details. As with any Clubman, the cabin space is disappointingly average. While it may wear a mini badge, this is far from being a truly small car. As a result, the cramped rear seats and underwhelming boot may come as a surprise. The weird rear doors in place of a hatch are a pain too, needing lots of clearance behind you to open fully and making loading and unloading a chore. The resulting split rear window also reduces visibility. However, while these may be concerns for buyers of lesser Clubmans, JCW customers are unlikely to care. Being the fastest Mini currently on sale, buyers will choose this in spite of its supposed practicality. Quite rightly, they'll be more concerned about what it's like to drive. Well, as we mentioned, this isn't just a longer JCW hatch, but an all-wheel drive Golf R rival. So what's a 4x4 Mini like on the road? Well, despite the power increase, the chassis has received only minor tweaks. Work has been done to improve the bone-shatteringly firm ride of the old car with some revised dampers and some optional suspension modes. It's a vast improvement for the ride quality, allowing you to concentrate on its curious handling. The steering is lightning quick, meaning progress tends to become somewhat staccato, sometimes making it a bit tricky to get into a smooth flow. There's a shed load of grip though, thanks in part to its sticky Michelin rubber, but mainly thanks to the all-wheel drive system. 
it leaves no room for any sideways heroism, but it does make the funky little mini feel very grown up. But in a world of grown up hot hatchbacks, shouldn't a JCW be a bit more cheeky? A bit more of a hooligan? Well, it's undeniably rapid, it's limited to 155 miles per hour, just like the Hot Hatch Elite, and it sounds great too. There is some artificial noise pumped in through the speakers though, but if any car can get away with that, surely it's a Mini. There's no manual option anymore, just an 8-speed auto with a rather jerky manual mode. Sadly though, you won't always feel inclined to rev it out to the limiter, with the bulk of the performance being delivered lower down the tachometer. The JCW then has matured. It's up there with the Golf R and S3, but despite its retro styling and cool Britannia image, it seems to have lost its playful charm. An impressive machine, make no mistake, but one that's lacking in character. Still to come, a brace of drop-top supercars. Coming up, the McLaren 600 LT Spider. First though. Recently here on Auto Mundial, we've been looking back at some of our favorite concept cars. We've seen everything from quirky EVs to sleek Grand Tourers. But every now and again, a concept comes along that doesn't necessarily fit into any particular category. And this is one such car. Before you say it, this is not a new NASA moon buggy, nor is it a prop for some upcoming sci-fi film. This is actually a recent oddball concept car from Audi. The completely mad i-Trail. The i-Trail joins three other electric concept cars from the German firm with very specific uses in mind. In this case, it's off-roading with the convenience of an SUV and the tech of an Ironman suit. 
As for power and performance, the total system has 429 brake horsepower going to all four wheels. While on tarmac, Audi reckons it will have a range of 310 miles and 155 miles on rougher terrain. And perhaps rather sensibly, the top speed is limited to 81 miles per hour. The iTrail is fully autonomous, allowing the driver to sit back and relax while the car worries about navigation. And while it can still handle itself off-road to a degree, a helping human hand is required for some of the more challenging terrains. To get a handle on the size of this thing, it's about the length of a Q3 with the width of a Q7. The designers clearly looked to the old VW beach buggies for the styling. The iTrail, though, looks like one from the future, with 22-inch wheels and huge 34-inch off-road tires. These all have variable sensor-controlled air pressure, which automatically adjusts the amount of air in each tire according to the terrain. With virtually no front or rear overhangs, the iTrail should be equally capable of handling the daily commute or serious off-roading. Equally important is all that glass for good visibility, which could also find its way into future Audis, according to the brand. And this is the thing you'll notice when you first check out the interior. Glass and lots of it. Audi calls it helicopter-style all-round visibility. But whatever the title, you're definitely going to get a clear outside view of the world. The cabin sticks to a more minimalist design. No huge infotainment screens here, only a dock for a smartphone and a pair of small driver information displays, which is counter to most current Audi models. As the iTrail has been built on a completely new platform, there's loads of seating and storage space. Open the front and rear suicide doors and you'll find large storage spaces in the front and the back with handy expedition-ready extras such as removable torches, binoculars and first aid kits. There's also a separate compartment in the rear boot designed for muddy outdoor gear. Elsewhere inside, the futuristic front seats with invisible belt line are accompanied by rear seats resembling hammocks, which can also double up as picnic chairs. The minimalist styling has also allowed the more futuristic ways of covering conventional features of a car. There are no headlights as such. Instead, there are five rotorless drones called Audi Light Pathfinders with built-in cameras and LEDs to illuminate the road ahead. When these are docked on the roof rack, they can act as spotlights or interior lighting. Properly gimmicky, but also pretty cool. There are also daylight running lights in the A-pillars, but who doesn't want their own army of drones at their disposal? Other little design hints have been added, such as a brand new tailgate Audi badge and those rather sharp robot eyes at the rear end. Clearly, this is a concept car, which means a real-world version would be a lot more conservative, to say the least. But it does give us a glimmer into the future possibilities from Audi and their SUVs. Sadly, though, we can't see drones replacing headlights on production cars anytime soon. Sports car makers have long been doing track focus special editions. They're great cash cows that can be built in limited numbers and sold for a premium. Designed for the most enthusiastic of enthusiasts, they represent the purest form of the cars, built purely for track days and driving pleasure. It would be sacrilege then to build a track focus special edition and then add weight by making it into a convertible. Well, not anymore, as everyone from Lotus to Lamborghini is taking tin openers to their hardcore models, and McLaren is no exception. This is the 600 LT Spider, an open top version of the sensational 600 LT Coupe. But what's the point? Isn't it just diluting the recipe of the distilled track day supercar? Well, 10 years ago we would have said yes, but McLaren has decided this is a niche worth filling. And boy has it paid off. 
Thanks to McLaren's ineffable carbon tub, the need for endless heavy bracing has been minimalised, limiting weight gain to just 48 kilos. Impressive stuff, especially when you take into account the folding electric hardtop. To get it as light as possible though, you'll need to get ticking boxes on the options list. The Club Sport Pack adds the lighter seats from the Senna, lighter wheel nuts, yes really, and more carbon fibre. Then you can opt to do without a stereo and air conditioning, which saves a further 13 kilos. It would seem rude not to really when you consider the lengths McLaren have gone to to reduce weight from the standard 570S on which it's based. The wiring harness is 4 kilos lighter, for example, while binning the glove box saves another all important kilogram. All of this obsessive weight saving means that the 592 brake horsepower V8 propels the Spider from 0 to 62 in just 2.9 seconds, just like the coupe. Top speed is 201 miles per hour or 196 with the roof down. On the road or even on track, you'll be hard pushed to discern any real differences from the hard top. It really is an incredible achievement. But it's not the only car McLaren has taken a blowtorch to. The flagship series production model, the 720S, has also received the Spider treatment. This time though, a little more work has been done to retain the coupe's rigidity. The 720S is arguably the greatest supercar on sale right now, so the new Spider version has everything to lose. Worryingly, that signature mono-cage carbon tub has been altered. Uh-oh, thankfully the changes are minor, and once again, the weight gain comes in at a smidge under 50 kilograms. McLaren is particularly proud of its new electric roof, which goes up and down in just 11 seconds at speeds of up to 31 miles per hour. Visibility takes a slight hit thanks to the new buttresses, but that's a small price to pay for infinite headroom in a 720S. But has McLaren pulled the same trick it did with the 600? Is the 720S Spider as good as the coupe? In a word, yes. The 2.8 second 0 to 62 time remains the same, while 0.1 seconds have been added to the 0 to 124 miles per hour time. Well, it could be worse. On the road, the Spider remains comfortable and refined, no matter how fast you go. In fact, the joy of the 720S is that it's a joy to drive at any speed, and lopping off the roof has only added to the car's any speed demeanor. Taking a spirited drive along a mountain pass or cruising around city streets, we see no reason to buy the coupe when the Spider is that good. Join us again next week on Auto Mundial as we get up close and personal with the mighty Audi RS7.